Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. On Sunday morning at 7 a.m. and 8.55 a.m. and at 11 a.m., we are going to gather and worship our Lord Jesus Christ who triumphed over death for our sake. But we're not there yet. Tonight, we worship Christ who bore our sins on the cross. Tonight, we worship Christ who exemplified his love by dying for us. Therefore, tonight, let us worship Christ crucified. Please join your hearts and voices with mine as we are called to worship. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? To remember what Jesus did for us, even in the midst of our brokenness. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? To offer our thanksgiving, even in the midst of our pain. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? To seek the Lord with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To give God our praise. Sisters and brothers, why are we here tonight? to unite our voices with all people of faith as we worship the Holy One who gave his life for our sins.
You may be seated. We are lucky to have a God who loves us so much that he died on the cross for us. But it is important that we recognize that it is our sin, our brokenness, our rebelliousness, our stubbornness that put him on that cross. Confident in God's love for us that is shown in Jesus Christ who died for us, let us confess our brokenness through the prayer of confession. Let us pray it together. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking grace is cheap, forgetting your sacrifice for us on the cross. Forgive us, Lord, for using the cross as a trinket or piece of art, forgetting the agony, loneliness, and sorrow it represents. Forgive us, Lord, for being desensitized to human cruelty, forgetting that every victim is a creature of God. Forgive us, Lord, for being disinterested about injustice in the lives of your children, forgetting that this ignorance still nails innocent people to their own crosses. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking that our need to be sacrificial is unnecessary, forgetting that we still must remain strong and defend others against evil in the world. Forgive us, Lord, for forgetting, denying, and abandoning Jesus when he needs us the most. Receive our prayers offered in all humility as we remember and honor Christ, our Lord, who dies for us still. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you in the name of our crucified Lord. If we've been paying attention, we'll notice that darkness bookends Jesus' earthly life, but in two very different ways. We welcome joyfully the darkness that accompanies Jesus' birth. At Christmas time, we typically pay special attention to the detail that Jesus came into the world during the night, when it was dark, when everybody was still and sleeping. We pay attention to the shepherds abiding in their fields by night, when a heavenly host of angels illumined the sky, sending those shepherds scurrying to find the manger in expectation. We pay attention to the brilliant star that lit up the dark night sky, guiding the curious magi to follow until they found the infant savior. In this darkness, we find God's perfect gift to us, in fact, it is God with us, Emmanuel, the infant Jesus, bringing us hope, peace, love, and joy. Tonight, however, we don't welcome the darkness, nor our part in it. On this night, we pay attention to the darkness but for very different reasons. For even our perfect Savior was not free from confronting darkness, brought on not by hope and peace and joy and love, 
but brought on instead by evil, pain, suffering, and hate. We should not be comfortable tonight. We should feel unsettled by this. When Jesus' tortured and broken body hung on the cross, the scriptures tell us that all of creation responded as darkness fell over the land. The sun and the moon were covered, the world stopped turning, wind ceased to blow and waters did not roll. The earth opened with immense shaking and trembling. The land groaned and wept. God's earth went dark. God's people, however, used the darkness as a camouflage, as an invisibility cloak to shield them from the horror of admitting to themselves that they had first stabbed Jesus in the back before he ever hung on that cross. Judas loaded his pockets with 30 pieces of silver by pointing Jesus out to the authorities, betraying Jesus and the other disciples along with him. Peter, the one upon whom Jesus would build the church, denied even knowing Jesus three separate times, and he crept away into the night. Who knows where the other disciples ended up, somewhere behind locked doors, hiding in fear for their own lives. It must have been all too surreal. Did they ever wonder how the last three years had all come down to this? Indeed, darkness seems to bookend Jesus' earthly life. And the darkness Jesus experienced must certainly have been the heaviest because virtually everyone he believed he could trust, everyone he loved, everyone he knew deeply and closely, they retreated into the night, abandoning him. And let us not forget the two criminals who hung on either side of him one mocking him while the other asking for grace, while an angry crowd jeered from the sidelines of a garbage dump, because that's where crucifixions took place. Jesus died a slow, agonizing, tortured death, all alone and abandoned. To add further insult to his injury, then he descended into hell, casting him further into a dark abyss for us. All of this was by no fault of his own, but for the sake of those then and all of us now, for all of our faults and our failures, for our sins, the thoughtless sins we don't even know we're committing, and the ones that are egregious and unspeakable. But the gift of God comes to us yet again, but in very different packaging. No longer an infant swaddled in cloth, but a grown man beaten, tortured, abused, our innocent Savior, God with us, Emmanuel, alone in the darkness where it appears all light is absent. Twentieth century Reformed theologian, the late Dr. Shirley Guthrie writes in his essential book on theological discourse, Christian doctrine, quote, there is no place, not even hell itself, where God is not present and at work with loving justice and just love. There is no place, not even hell itself, where God is not present and at work with loving justice and just love. 
So then in the midst of this darkness, our darkness tonight, we can recall that even though Jesus knew Judas would betray him, Judas was welcomed, welcomed to eat the bread and drink the cup at the Passover meal where Jesus gives us the Last Supper. And then Jesus would kneel down and wash Judas's dirty feet with humility and grace, with loving justice and just love. Even though Jesus knew Peter would betray him, Peter was welcome to eat that same bread and drink from that same cup and likewise, Jesus would kneel down on the floor, taking off his outer garment and washing Peter's feet with humility and grace, with loving justice and just love. Even though Jesus knew that almost every one of his followers would abandon him, that they would scatter and hide, Jesus welcomed each one of them to eat the bread and to drink the cup. And he would likewise kneel down and wash their nasty, dirty feet with humility and grace, with loving justice and just love. And were he physically present here with us tonight, Jesus would welcome us to the same table to eat the bread and drink the cup, and he would kneel down and wash our tired, weary, sweaty feet. And he would do so with humility and grace, with loving justice and just love. Jesus died for this. He died for them. He died for us. Do we deserve this kind of grace? Do we deserve this kind of loving justice and just love? Some days, no, we don't. We deny, we abandon, we betray, we ignore, we say hurtful things, we think impure thoughts, and we do impure things. And that is just a bit of the darkness within each of us that Jesus dies for over and over and over again. But some days we do the right thing and we say the right thing and we offer grace and humility to others and we share God's gospel message and we do things with loving justice and just love, and Jesus sees the light within us, breaking through our darkness, knowing, <laughs> believing that there is hope for us yet. And so he dies for us again with loving justice and just love. Jesus would go through it all again if he had to, I think. I think he would die on a cross again for us because he believes we are worth redeeming. He believes we are worth being saved. So then maybe that will compel us to do the right thing and say the right thing and act with loving justice and just love more often than not. Tonight, however, we put ourselves aside, our vain pursuits and our egocentric thoughts and our petty arguments, and we do our part to quiet any voice in us but God's alone so that we might be fully present for Jesus we might be the ones comforting him in the darkness, standing by him, standing up for him in an effort to lessen his pain. Let us then hold fast to our Jesus, knowing that the darkness of tonight and our waiting and despair will yield hope, peace, joy, and love in the early morning of Sunday.
we hold fast to our Lord, knowing that God can do the most unthinkable, unimaginable, unconceivable acts of loving justice and just love in the places that feel the darkest. Amen. The betrayal of Jesus, as depicted in the Gospel of Matthew. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one to have not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi? And he replied, You have said so.
the denial of Jesus foretold by the Psalms. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. Hear how Jesus experienced loneliness, according to Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 41. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here. And keep awake. Going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to them. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners.
hear these words where Jesus is accused in the Gospel of Mark. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this, their point and their testimony did not agree. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed, them, handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. The suffering of Jesus prophesied by Isaiah. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Listen to the story of Jesus' crucifixion, as told by the Gospel of Matthew. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. 
Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. If he trusts in God, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son.
the death of our Lord. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. <laughs> 